Well, thank you so much for attending this session on Open Contrail and OpenShift. Let me just start by uh, you know, thanking you guys for your time and your trust in joining this session, especially in light of the Melbourne Cup, who is rekindled, if you're wondering, the name of the horse that won. I was just catching it outside. That's why I was a little bit late coming in. It's must do when you're in Australia, apparently. Um, and it's my first time. So um, yeah. What we're going to talk about is a little bit of the Contrail details. Some of that may be you know, new to many of you. Some of you may have attended many of the other sessions at the OpenStack Summit on Open Contrail or just have prior experience with it. Um, but we can keep it interactive and um, you know, put up your hand, ask questions. There's definitely a few different people from the Open Contrail community in the room that I can spy, so um, there's, there's lots of brain power here on that front. And then, of course, uh, you know, thanks to Red Hat for sponsoring this session. And um, kind of goes without saying that the same is true with respect to OpenShift. I'm sure there's lots of brain power in the room for that very popular platform based on Kubernetes. Yep, got to drop that word. The, uh, the agenda for today is, you know, pretty much going over the integration, right, um, that we've achieved. So <clears throat> if you follow the Open Contrail community, you'd probably know that uh, about a year and a half ago or so, we started integrating a sort of prototype slash alpha integration with Kubernetes and OpenShift, um, one of the, the earlier SDNs to do so, especially in the mature SDN space. and. Um, with the version 4.0 of Open Contrail that was released this June, we had formal uh, support uh, both in Juniper's commercial distribution of Contrail networking, the commercial edition of Open Contrail, if, you, if that uh, is not familiar to you, um, as well as in the Open Contrail community, uh, we released the containerized packages, right? They're all available on Docker Hub. If uh, you do need more background on Open Contrail as well, uh, I did a session this morning on Open Contrail and I'm putting the slide deck on SlideShare and I will share it on my LinkedIn. So James Kelly on LinkedIn from Juniper, uh, you probably easily find me because I post there a lot or on Twitter, James Kelly Net is my handle. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, the session this morning was not recorded. That's the only uh, downside. So it's not going to be part of the OpenStack anthology of videos. Right, so um, just a few words about myself before we kick off, too. Um, so James Kelly, been at Juniper for 11 years. I'm a software guy. I started Juniper as a developer evangelist for our software development kits. Then I went into product management. And I went into lead cloud architect of the go-to-market division, basically helping customers, partners, and a um, you know, little bit of everything. <laughs> some technical stuff, some stuff that's you know, fluffy and marketing and fun. Um, but spending a lot of things, and you know, one of the great things I get to do besides talking to customers is come and talk to uh, audiences such as yourselves. So again, just thanks for having me. Right, so let's kick off again with a little bit more of the agenda besides just talking about the integration. Here's a little bit more of a list, right? So we'll do a quick introduction of what Open Contrail is, not like a full scale 101, but you know, a fairly quick overview for whatever time allows. And we'll kind of talk about the integration with OpenShift as well as with Kubernetes because uh, hopefully if you're in this session, you're familiar with OpenShift and you probably know that it's kind of a a pass wrapper over top of Kubernetes. Um, so we'll talk about the integration with OpenShift uh, and Kubernetes in generic terms, because many of the points of integration are frankly the same. We'll talk about you know, the relevant features that Open Contrail implements uh, in that space, how you install it. And uh, we have plenty of live uh, demos that we can do or DIY setups that you can do on the public cloud for like a few dollars yourself that are quite easy to spin up. And we've got like the OpenShift Commons community has had us to do briefings, and you can find those videos on YouTube and whatnot. So there's there's plenty of examples of demos, and since I didn't want to sacrifice myself today, I figured I would uh, not do the demo, that and just for the sake of time. But hopefully we can keep it just as fun by having questions throughout. <clears throat> 
Right. So background on Open Contrail. Uh, if you were completely starting from scratch, Open Contrail, uh, you'd probably want to like think about as an open source project at opencontrail.org. And it was seeded by Juniper Networks in 2013 when we acquired this company called Contrail Systems that had some crazy ideas to think about doing OpenStack networking wildly differently. And from the you know, roughly five years that we've had since then, we've gone from you know, pretty much the best open SDN solution for OpenStack, according to many of the super user surveys. You probably would have heard us there if you are interested in networking and, and looked at us there. Um, we went from OpenStack to also implementing uh, networking for a VMware stack for vSphere, as well as just supporting ESXi uh, with OpenStack or with vSphere. Uh, and then obviously paying attention quite closely, it would be hard not to, to, to notice everything that was happening in the Kubernetes and the cloud native space. Um, me being a software guy and many of the, the people paying close attention to what's happening in that space. I mean, even if you're attending the OpenStack summits, you would hear a lot about Kubernetes in 2015 and 16. Then we basically set off to say, you know, we're going to um, own the, the SDN space and win the SDN space in the Kubernetes ecosystem as well and in the cloud native ecosystem with respect to container networking, with respect to the container orchestration systems, Mesos, OpenShift, and certainly I think Kubernetes, you know, by all of the, the metrics is kind of winning that race. And OpenShift kind of uh, obviously on top of that. Uh, so that's a real quick amount of stuff about you know, the history of Open Contrail. Obviously, you know, it's a software-defined networking project, as I've said. It takes an overlay approach to networking. Uh, there's, there's so much more that I could say, but just you know, as far as time allows, and because everybody's probably on different levels here, I'll just assume that um, if you are unfamiliar with Open Contrail, that you'll, you'll go and check out some of the, the other background material as needed for yourself. Right, so a quick, uh, a quick pitch, you know, um, a value proposition of basically you know, why Open Contrail is useful in OpenShift and beyond. I think this is probably the strongest argument to adopt Open Contrail. One, to rule them all, right? Just like the Lord of the Rings, or as we've twisted it here, rule them all with one, automated secure open SDN. So as I was saying, you know, whether you look at the history of Open Contrail going from the best SDN for OpenStack to then supporting VMware and, and container networking with all the different orchestration systems, whether you think about how it works in private cloud slash on-premise or hosted data centers where you're really controlling your infrastructure and your infrastructure as a service and how it works in that space, or whether you're deploying purely cloud native and on the public cloud, like let's say on you know, Azure or AWS and spinning up an OpenShift cluster there. Um, you know, Open Contrail is applicable in both of those places. Uh, you can run like the Contrail V router on bare metal. You can run it and attach ESXi, KVM, and Docker workloads for a long time. Right. So, um, that's basically you know, the, the main argument. Now, there's a lot of other arguments I did talk about in my session this morning. If you look at the cloud native uh, ecosystem with respect to networking, um, funny enough, right next to the booth that I'm representing for Juniper Networks, there's the booth for the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And they've got this nice chart right, of like a million different logos. And one of the sections on that chart is cloud native networking, and it's actually quite busy. And <laughs> there's probably, I don't know, uh, somewhere like 15, 20 different networking solutions that you could choose. So that's just networking. But it turns out that the same amount of variables are there in all of the different areas. So it's quite overwhelming. And I think the point of the, the title of this slide kind of rings true with many people in IT, right? I mean, if you're, if you're doing IT for a long time, you know, you're, you're keeping up with innovation and whatnot, but you're still sort of staying true to the steadfast values of consolidation and standardization. And when you have all of these point systems for different solutions, it's just so much context switching for, you know, in this case, the network operator, but whoever is touching that piece of tooling, right, that tool chain. Um, and I do 
you know, sort of subscribe to the best tool for every job, but you've got to <clears throat> do that really within reason and make sure that you don't already have something that can actually do that well. Because if you're adopting new tools all the time because you're saying, oh, this is the best for that, that's the best for that, eventually you're going to have a million different tools, right? And that's going to be impossible to manage. This is basically what Gartner calls bimodal IT. They sort of talk about it not as multimodal IT of adopting a million different things, but they talk about it as most companies, most IT organizations probably have around roughly two different tool chains. One set of tools to do legacy applications, another set of tools to do the fast-moving, high-paced you know, DevOps, so forth, right? And if you have an SDN that works across both of those different environments, that's really unifying a variable. And I, I definitely subscribe also to the fact that in the multi-cloud world, um, unifying your tool chain and having something that's portable as well across lots of different infrastructure environments is paramount to the success of people that are trying to do multi-cloud uh, successfully, right? Because everybody will have a multi-cloud environment at some point or another. Um, and if you don't believe me, I'm not talking about AWS and Azure or OpenStack and VMware or OpenStack and Google Cloud. I mean, like, even if you're just doing Amazon, you're probably doing multiple accounts. You're probably doing multiple AZs, multiple regions, um, multiple VPCs. And from that standpoint, you know, your networking tool chain, I would behoove you to, to uh, you know, think about that that you need to unify it across those things, but then also probably across whatever, connecting up legacy workloads, connecting up um, other things that might run on-prem and so forth. So it's a multi-cloud reality um, for many that aren't in sort of startup mode. It's a uh, bimodal reality. And I think that this is just one of those different projects that actually allows us to unify one of our many tool chain variables today, as opposed to offering up some niche point thing um, that might look really sexy and attractive, but you know, ultimately allow, make us do a lot more context switching uh, than what we're used to, which affects not just you know, technology, um, it affects people and processes, obviously, as well. Yeah, so a quick overview slide of a little bit of everything. Um, Obviously, the environment options at the top I've sort of covered. Um, some of the things like I didn't mention is like Amdocs around NFE and whatnot um, may or may not be useful for this audience that is listening to, to something about OpenShift. With respect to all the services uh, or what you might call the features of OpenContrail, I think we've easily got the richest set of features of any SDN uh, system and platform available today in open source or proprietary, um, take your pick. And this is just a quick glance at all of them. I covered them in more detail this morning again, and we've got so many things that cover them, so I'll kind of skip over that. Uh, with respect to the control plane, um, so Open Control is not only open source, it was uh, taking a radically different approach at the time that it was incepted, because everybody was going and chasing OVSDB or OpenFlow, or let's pick a new open standard protocol, or we'll pick a new protocol, we'll invent one, and then we'll, we'll make it a standard, right? Which was basically what happened with things like OVSDB and VXLAN and OpenFlow, right? There's even new standards bodies to standardize them. Uh, OpenContrail did something totally different. It said, look, you know, like in networking, everything is brown on the edges. Whatever domain you're going to apply an SDN system to, it's always going to need to federate with other networks. Networks are inherently connected to other things. And the way that things connect in the network is with these open standards protocols that have been around for a long time. Why don't we use what we've already got? And if we don't have it perfect, let's try to evolve it. But it turns out there's this thing called multi-protocol BGP and L3 and L2 VPNs that have been around for a really long time and scale quite well. And if we could just you know, software architect that a little bit different in a logically centralized but distributed way for a data center and for a cloud system, um, well, we could actually do virtual networking in a really dynamic way. And so OpenContrail was founded with the open standards premise of 
not just using open standards, but using open standards that are proven and trying to actually contribute to what already exists instead of just going and starting from scratch, um, which is one of the reasons why you, know, you see you know, other logos other than, you know, for example, the company that I work at, Juniper, you know, we definitely have integrations with our own switches, but we integrate with other switches and routers as well. And if you don't know, um, let me first of all say Open Contrail has no ties at all to any um, networking hardware. It's not like something like Cisco ACI where you, you have an SDN system that's completely tied and tethered to the hardware. It's very much untethered. It works on any IP network, hence why I was just describing it working on top of AWS and stuff like that. But there are some cases, the edge cases, right, where you're leaving your set of you know, overlays between all of the Contrail V routers, in which case you need to maybe connect to a bare metal legacy Oracle database, or you just need to connect north-south outside of your data center, right, through an actual physical router or maybe a, a virtualized gateway if you're running that. <clears throat> And those systems are, are outside of the scope of Contrail, right? You know, you've got physical switching, like from whatever, uh, Cisco today, or you've got you know, this, this gateway router for your data center, which is an ALU router or something, right? Um, these are, these are you know, vendors that didn't exist you know, inside of the, the purview of the Contrail engineering team as it was developed mostly within Juniper for the first, you know, um, year or so until we open sourced it and then other developers started coming on board slowly more and more. So it was, it was actually great that we um, used those open standards because it allows us to federate not only with other SDN systems and other instances of open contrail, but with other networking equipment, of course. Um, right, and then at the bottom, connectivity. I mean, I think I've already mentioned this in passing, but just supporting virtual machines from various flavors of hypervisors. Um, containers, you know, implementing the CNI standard uh, for OpenShift and Kubernetes, and being able to run the vRouter directly on bare metal servers if they're Linux, or just attaching those endpoints behind uh, what we call a top of rack switch node um, that manages a top of rack switch that has bare metal endpoints behind it. Yeah, so. Moving on from the features and a quick overview, I mean, the busy chart uh, that we often build out a little bit slower than just flashing it all up at once, like I just did, is this diagram here for the Contrail architecture. So the fat blue tunnels are the uh, overlays that would be you know, MPLS over some IP protocol, UDP in the case of vRouter to vRouter. Or, um, so that's the overlay bit that I mentioned. The other way to really digest this diagram in a really simple way is just kind of breaking it roughly in the middle there. Um, you can see that there's two compute nodes that we've shown on the bottom. And on the compute nodes, there's this thing called the vRouter. So the vRouter is one component of the two important ones in Contrail. And the other component is in the middle there, the Contrail controller. Now, those things are not one vRouter you know, process or one Contrail controller process. There are actually you know, various things, and you know, we can go into the details of that, but it's just beyond the scope of what we're talking about right now. But as you can see, right, I mean, the controller itself doesn't have any single points of failure. It supports things like in-service software upgrades, stuff like you know, that you'd expect in a microservice-oriented uh, modern software architecture right, that scales out. And then how does this thing actually get driven at the end of the day? If you take any SDN system, you know, it has some API, and that's where the REST um, dotted line label is. So there's a northbound RESTful API. It supports RBAC and authentication with HTTPS. And this is where things like the Neutron plugin fit in or the Kubernetes plugin fit in, which is how we also drive OpenShift, which we'll see now. So that was the quick primer and background on Open Contrail. Um, hopefully that was useful. If there's still things that are confusing, um, please ask right now. It's fine. Or um, come see me afterwards or, or any of the Open Contrail community members. Or come and have a chat with us on the boat cruise tonight, um, which is open for registration. I'll tell you more about that at the end. Um, but yeah, right now we'll kind of get into the next bit of the agenda, right? The integration with OpenShift. <clears throat>
So this is, uh, if, you're, if you're following the OpenShift Commons days, the OpenShift uh, Commons briefings, you probably will have seen this chart before, right? And there is this networking block there, most commonly deployed with the default option of multi-tenant SDN, um, as it's labeled by Red Hat, and we basically just replace that. Um, so if you're thinking about the, the big picture or the abstract picture, that's sort of where it starts. And we do that with origin, hence we can do it with any instance of OpenShift that you're managing yourself. In other words, something that's not OpenShift as a service. Right, so this is basically how we integrate with OpenShift and Kubernetes. Um, obviously, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with OpenShift, again, this is background that I kind of assume you know, but um, OpenShift does all of its container orchestration through Kubernetes. And hence, all of the dynamic networking that we need to do for Kubernetes that we implemented for Contrail directly uh, is exactly the same and, and applies to the OpenShift environment. So how do you parse this diagram? Um, well, you've got your compute nodes at the bottom and your management nodes at the top, right? And basically, in a Kubernetes cluster, you're probably familiar with two kinds of nodes, right? The master or minion, or now they call it like the master and node, which is a little bit more abstract, but those are basically your compute nodes. And the same thing is true with OpenShift. You've got these master nodes where you've got the OpenShift slash Kubernetes software running. You've got the API there. That's where the GUI um, you know, hangs off of. And many other components, you know, a whole suite of controllers and the scheduler. And then down on the actual compute nodes, you have things like the kubelet running and C advisor and other stuff that's not even shown here. But obviously, from a networking standpoint, um, Kubernetes had an opinionated way of doing networking. It was going to be all layer three networking, IP based. And they came up with a new standard for doing that, which sort of simplified what Docker had previously done with CNM, the container networking model, and, and libnetwork. And they called it CNI, right? And this is basically a, a standard way of doing networking. CNI is a cloud-native computing foundation project, which under the Linux Foundation today. So that's very much standard. Now, we've implemented that as Contrail. It's a temporary process that starts up um, whenever you know, the kubelet needs to call it. And it will invoke various things to stitch the containers that are stopped and started um, as things come and go into the vRouter instead of what would you have there in place of that. Well, it would depend on maybe if you're using some other SDN system or basically you know, if it was like you know, regular Docker networking, the Docker Zero Linux bridge. So we've got this um, vRouter. The vRouter, I didn't mention this in passing um, when I talked about it before, but the vRouter is not one thing. It's actually two things. It's a control plane vRouter that runs as a user space process on these Linux boxes or VMs. And then there's also a kernel module, which could be implemented um, on a smart NIC, or it could be implemented a DPDK, but most people deploy it as a uh, Linux kernel module. And uh, very good performance out of that, you know, uh, basically you know, better than in, in the Kubernetes case than the Linux kernel itself. And we do replace much of what is done inside of the Linux kernel, some of which we'll talk about in terms of what the Linux kernel does with this kube proxy controller that it's always like constantly shifting around and recompiling IP table rules. Um, to do a lot of things, but mostly in NAT and Kubernetes and OpenShift services and um, service load balancing and whatnot. So again, this is background that I kind of assume you guys know. So that's basically how the containers get hooked up. Um, as with Kubernetes and OpenShift, we're not talking about individual containers. We're talking about pods. Pods have a networking construct that is the same for all of the containers inside of that pod. And the vRouter is still controlled by OpenContrail. But how does OpenContrail know about all of the containers that are coming and going? Well, we built this new component in Go called the Contrail Kube Manager at the top there. So this was you know, something that we've been working on for quite a while, almost two years now, probably, in the OpenContrail community. Uh, from the early prototype days back around Kubernetes 1.1 through to, like, for example, when we FRS'd it in Contrail 4.0. So 
What the Kube Manager really does is it's just an API watcher. It watches the Kubernetes API, and it looks for the various constructs that it needs to network, in particular pods, services, ingress, because we also implement ingress with an ingress controller, which I'll talk about. And um, yeah, so obviously we, we do all of the networking for that that way. That's um, a little bit different than how Neutron works in the OpenStack setup, right? And as you probably know, if you've used OpenShift or Kubernetes, it's not like you go and pre-provision a virtual network and then start attaching things to it. In OpenShift or Kubernetes, it sort of assumes uh, a couple of networks that already exist, and things are just started on those. And we'll talk about how you can customize that with Contrail if you want to. But basically, this is how it works. And if you had a stock OpenShift cluster that you're running today or thinking of running, and you wanted to run you know, Contrail SDN with it, you would not need to know anything about Contrail SDN to have it work for you. Um, you would never need to touch it. Similar to, like, let's say, if you were an OpenStack user and you just wanted to replace Neutron with Contrail um, to have things like better scalability, performance, reliability, again, like, you wouldn't necessarily need to know anything over and above what Horizon or the OpenStack API does. You could just go on your way as a, a cloud user or cloud administrator using the OpenShift uh, interface and be perfectly fine and happy and really none the wiser maybe if you're a developer and user of the cluster. That said, there are certain things that a developer or a DevOps pro or a cluster administrator may do with respect to things like namespaces or network policy, which is the first class citizen in Kubernetes as of 1.7, that's out of tech preview. Um, <clears throat> and of course, there's tons of things that exist inside of Contrail that you can do that have nothing to do with what networking setups exist and, and primitives exist within Kubernetes or OpenShift. So there's a lot of extra you know, value and, and a lot of extra you know, use cases or customization with respect to the network and networking and security, DHCP and address management, et cetera, et cetera, that you could do with Contrail. So we'll touch on some of that. But when it comes to the basic concepts of Kubernetes and OpenShift uh, uses the, really the same vernacular, uh, here's how things translate into OpenContrail. Now this might only make sense if you're familiar with OpenContrail again, so that disclaimer that you kind of need to have that background. But namespaces, right? What is a namespace? It's a space for names, as I say. <laughs> it's like so that you don't have overlapping names that conflict with each other. And then as Kubernetes and OpenShift has kind of evolved over time, there's certain things like resource limits that you can associate with namespaces or RBAC that you can associate with namespaces now too. Um, with respect to how that translates into Contrail, you may or may not elect, depending on how you configure Contrail, there's a, a simple set of configurations that you can um, you know, adjust when you're deploying Contrail with Kubernetes. You could just have it work the, the same way that Kubernetes and OpenShift works by default, which is, in my opinion, not very secure, but very simple. Basically means that all things that lie on all of the namespaces can talk to each other uh, by default. There's not any separation or isolation that the namespace actually implies. But if you wanted to achieve that, one of the things you could do is you could have different tenants or different networks created in Contrail for every namespace that gets instantiated in OpenShift. Pod, right? So the pod is the atomic uh, unit of Kubernetes and OpenShift that contains the actual containers. Um, we kind of map that to the same thing that we've been using to network virtual machines or basically endpoints in Contrail, right? So it, that is the IP endpoint um, and by default, you know, Kubernetes and OpenShift assume layer three networking, but we could also do layer two, I suppose. So service, um, a service is basically an abstract concept in OpenShift and Kubernetes, right? It's a service load balancer that sits in front of a set of microservices that are all doing the same thing, basically a group of pods that are selected with a label selector. And so most people kind of think of a service as an elastic IP address or this this service load balancer, the load balancer word is used quite often. And we implement that with ECMP load balancing inside of our Contrail view router. 
ingress. So um, one of the things that happens is a little bit different in a microservices cluster as opposed to uh, load balancing from the outside. So I mean, if you're if you're coming from the OpenStack world or if you're coming from the non-cloud native world, you're a cloud tourist, as Red Hat would say. You might think about load balancing in different ways. So just to kind of put everybody on the same page, right? So in the cloud native container microservices world, where you have containers that are all implementing different tiers of an application, you know, you've got like let's just take three tiers as an example. I mean, I know it's played out and trite, but you know, like let's say the web tier, the application tier, and the database tier. So let's say that you have like five pods of each of those, right? So how does the web tier talk to the application tier? It's not like you address a pod individually out of those five. Every microservice tier like talks to another tier by talking to the service load balancer and their service discovery that involves usually DNS and stuff like that. Um, to take care of all of that. And this is, this is something that's uh, really cool and fascinating inside of OpenShift and Kubernetes. And if you don't know about it, I definitely encourage you to learn more about it. It's one of the most fundamental concepts to microservices architectures with Kubernetes and OpenShift, I'd say, and very powerful construct. So that is basically what a service is, right? It's a service load balancer. Now, for a web tier to talk to an app tier or an app tier to talk to a database, all of that communication happens within the cluster. But how does traffic actually come into the web tier in the first place, right? Like this is what people call ingress. It's the north-south traffic, in other words, um, for the cluster, right, as opposed to the east-west traffic. So east-west traffic, you could probably generalize with the service concept and north-south traffic you know, with the ingress uh, concept. So for the ingress concept uh, in Kubernetes and OpenShift, it's more oriented towards HTTP, HTTPS, and URLs. And um, you could implement that um, with things like you know, the Google Cloud load balancers, if you happen to be running in the Google Cloud. Or you could implement it with Nginx. Um, but there's actually this concept called ingress inside of Kubernetes. And uh, in the Kubernetes world, if you don't have an ingress controller, which by default you don't, uh, then those ingress objects are basically ignored. They don't do anything. In the OpenShift world, Red Hat has implemented uh, an ingress controller, you know, which they call the router, which is basically um, you know, routes are synonymous with ingress in the OpenShift world. In the Contrail world, we actually replace the ingress controller or if you don't have one in the Kubernetes world, uh, we implement it with Contrail. And Contrail has had an integration with HAProxy for several years now to do load balancing as a service for OpenStack, um, among other um, niche use cases of load balancing. And we basically implemented it um, that way. And then finally, at the bottom, network policy. So there is a concept called network policy in Contrail. And if you happen to like, have your Contrail hat on, you might think about what network policy means in that world. But if you take that off, if you're a networking ops person and put on your, your DevOps or your cluster ops hat, um, network policy is actually a first class concept in Citizen, I guess you'd say, within the OpenShift and Kubernetes space. I mentioned kind of quickly there that version 1.7 of Kubernetes, which came out, what, like four months ago now or something, um, is when network policy came out of tech preview and was officially GA. So network policy in Kubernetes was basically um, an object that you could declare with a few properties that basically just said what you're, what you're allowed to accept traffic from. And it was used in conjunction with a flag on most namespaces so that within the scope of a namespace, you could just have um, a default deny all. So by default, nothing can come into any of the pods that are there. And then you can effectively use these network policy objects to build a whitelist of what the pods are actually allowed to talk to. right? So this is a, a concept that's it's, it's fairly easy to understand. right? You just have like a port number and a service name, and you say, OK, well, I'm going to allow traffic from that into my, into my network policy. And then you go and apply that policy to whatever you want, like a set of pods that do a specific task or service, probably. So um, 
inside of Contrail, uh, we have this thing called security groups, which um, coincidentally, uh, Juniper announced this thing called Contrail Security a few months ago, which is interesting to look at. But for a long time, Contrail has had this concept of security groups, which allows people to arbitrarily slice and dice how they allow um, intercommunication between ver different endpoints that may be tagged or grouped, again, or labeled basically in these arbitrary ways, similar to how Kubernetes allows you to label things. And you know, obviously that could be useful so that you don't have traffic going from, let's say, like your dev to your test environment or your dev to your production <laughs> environment, hopefully. Or you don't have things going in between different tiers of the applications that aren't supposed to talk to each other. Or if you've got like a multi-tenant cluster, you don't have like things that are not supposed to be talking to each other, talking to each other, like Target's air conditioning system, talking to like the customer database, right, when they get act. So all of these things um, you know, are there for security measures, and Contrail implements that as security groups, basically. Um, again, there's, there's lots you could learn about that. So let's get into some of the details now. Just a, a quick time check. So what time does the session end? Now? OK, great. <laughs> Isolation types, so I did put extra details in the presentation, but we, originally I only had three slides left. So isolation types, you can isolate by namespace or by the default cluster way, right? I mentioned like you can tell Contrail, I want every namespace to be on its own virtual network or even its own Contrail tenant, which will imply it's on its own virtual network as well, but within a tenant construct within Contrail. So this is basically the quick overview picture um, you know, for the non-geeks in the room, like default is like what happens by default. Everything can talk to everything. Namespace isolation is what I just described. And custom isolation is basically when you want to customize certain things to reside on various uh, virtual networks. So how does this actually work in terms of the YAML and the objects if you are um, one of the, the people in the room that are familiar with these stuff? So it's basically all annotations. So here's an example of the annotation in a namespace object. You simply say annotation opencontrol.org isolation equals true. And boom, now your namespaces are isolated on different networks. If you, for some reason, wanted your services to be accessible across namespaces, you could apply this extra option of service isolation equals false. And there's the example of that. If you wanted to have your pods reside on a virtual network that might exist outside of your, you know, the scope of your Kubernetes cluster, or you wanted to customize the name of it for some reason, um, you could do it like this, where the blue custom is a virtual network that would be created. And there's the example of that. Ingress load balancing, basically this is a picture to describe what I've already talked about. Um, we're not here to really focus on the details of this, but you know you can do simple fan out. You can do like breakout with respect to the different URL paths, and this all gets implemented by Contrail. Network policies again. Um, I don't have the example of it uh, in YAML here, but you can go and look in the Kubernetes or OpenShift documentation for how that works. We implement them. Uh, it's as simple as that. With respect to services, there's four different types of services that you can create in Kubernetes and OpenShift. And um, by default, most people use this cluster IP type, which means that there's an IP address that gets allocated from um, the cluster IP addresses, which is basically the, the subnet pool of IPs for all of the service addresses. Everything else usually comes out of the, the subnets that's associated with pods. and um, if you wanted to have those cluster IP addresses, like let's say externally accessible, maybe you could just share your IP addresses for every single service and have that, that cluster IP address pool externally accessible. But that's probably not a good idea for most people. You might want to use floating IP addresses from Contrail in a customized way. Or what you can do is you can create this external type when you have um, the load balancer type of service. And it will then create this thing called an external IP address, which is usually associated with a routing and IPAM, uh, IP address uh, space that is externally accessible, that is separate from your cluster IP address space. So something that only exists. OK, so I saved one surprise for last. Um, when you're running OpenShift on OpenStack, 
it turns out that you could have one SDN for OpenStack and another SDN for OpenShift. With Contrail, you only need one. We can have a unified management and control plane, a unified forwarding plane where we do one encapsulation instead of two, and we go into the details of this uh, on YouTube and various things. But there's cool stuff about this where you can obviously put like the container or pod on the same network as a virtual machine that might exist inside of your OpenStack cluster. And you could equally well do that same thing if you had an OpenStack cluster and an OpenShift cluster side by side instead of nested. But nested mode uh, kicks ass on uh, OpenContrail. So if you're using OpenShift on OpenStack, then really there's no competition. You should definitely be using OpenContrail. How do you get going with this? Uh, we're working on making it seamless so that if you deploy OpenShift origin using the Ansible script, you can just set a flag and it will pull everything OpenContrail related in. But in the meantime, you would probably do it either with the Helm chart or by using the Contrail Ansible installation. Um, so you basically install OpenShift and then you install OpenContrail side by side. Um, other things, if you happen to be using, um, you know, you want to customize the installation, you can find the OpenContrail containers on Docker Hub. Or if you happen to be using something like a commercial distribution of OpenStack, which has its own lifecycle management, like OpenStack Director does from Red Hat, again, you can just flag OpenContrail or Contrail Networking as an option and it'll pull it in. Okay, last slide, just the resources, right? If you want to go and watch some videos on this, if you, I highly recommend the one link there of the OpenShift Commons briefing and demo, but there's plenty more here. Um, if you want to try this out and get your hands dirty, the labs at the bottom with OpenShift Origin or OpenShift Enterprise Edition, Lab 2 and Lab 3 respectively, um, go and play with it if you're a developer or if you're a cluster um, admin and familiar with it. Other than that, yeah, Sorry for going a few minutes over time. But again, just thank you guys so much for your time and your trust. I do hope that you will join us in the open Contrail community to shape the future of SDN in general. But more specifically, I would say taking the first step is just coming and having a beer or having a drink tonight on the OpenShift cruise, uh, three hours, food and beverage. And if you guys need to know the URL to register, you can go to opencontrail.org or Maytree's holding up cards in the back with the URL of how to register and come and have some fun. Thanks, guys.